welcome back to day two of the summit. Yesterday was was awesome. I loved it. Uh, the conversations, uh, selfishly for me, I learned a ton. Hopefully, you're learning a lot alongside us. That's the goal here. Uh, again, it's to keep your emotions in check. Understand that there's an intermediate to longer term cycle here to risk manage. We're trying to find all the, the touch points in terms of people that have deep edges that can help you contextualize that. Uh, we're going to start today with one of our best leadoff hitters of all time from Tejas. Uh, how you doing, Danielle? I wish we had a little bit more baseball to actually go along with the with the analogy, Keith. I'm missing it about now. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're not missing uh, your subject matter, and I want to lead off with that, which is, is is what the Federal Reserve doing right now legal? Uh, I think that that's going to be a question that is resolved in the courts when the dust settles. I don't know that I I, I don't know that anybody can answer that question right now because of the degree to which they're circumventing the law and the independence that they're handing over to the Treasury and by extension to uh, to the White House. Mm -hmm. Can you get into some of the plumbing on that? You've been tweeting about it. I mean, um, I, I know that you have some 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 feelings about you know whether it's right or wrong too. Um, but just the, the 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 plumbing, like when you say it's you're we're not sure. I mean, then it can't be crystal clear legal. I assume. Well, I mean, think about Enron. They got away with off-balance sheet accounting for a long time mm -hmm. uh, until it didn't work anymore, until the insolvencies built up to such an extent that it blew up. So think about that the same way. Right now, what the Fed is doing is off-balance sheet. They're, they're, the, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 stipulates that the Fed can only own uh, paper that is backed by the full faith and guarantee of the United States government. So we're talking about treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, end of story. Uh, during the financial crisis, when I was in the Fed, we debated whether or not corporate bonds, we, whether we could go there or not, knowing that we had used uh, off-balance sheet vehicles to provide liquidity to, say, the commercial paper market. It was decided at the time that, no, we could not cross that Rubicon, and yet here we sit today. And that is kind of where I think that the argument is going to be decided in the courts. They have set up special purpose vehicles at the Treasury. They started with investment grade bonds, but my point is the Fed can put anything in it they want mm -hmm. because of the structure that they've chosen. So I've actually moved past, in my mind mentally at least, and I think the stock market has as well, I've moved past the next really bad round of unemployment data to say that the Fed is already assuming that they're going to be in the stock market buying ETFs. Mm -hmm. Well, buying, I mean, buying and actually suggesting that they could buy uh, or will buy uh, fixed income ETFs. There was quite a move, obviously, last week. It shook a lot of shorts you know, to the core. Uh, people that are obviously short the debt cycle, uh, which is a pretty clean cut thing to do at the end of an economic cycle. Uh, again, they're basically saying, hey, you can't do that for now. I, I wonder, like, how deeply have you looked at that? And, or is there any transparency at all in terms of how much HYG, the high yield ETF, or JNK, the junk bonds ETF, uh, that they actually did buy or if they did at all? I'm not so sure that any of these vehicles are set up or not, Keith. It, look, just because they announce something, and this is something really, really, really important to distinguish. Just because they make an announcement doesn't mean that it's set up. Yeah. They just now launched the commercial paper facility that was announced, I think, on March 23rd. So this is a bureaucratic machine. And the reason I bring this up is because it's a really important point. Stock market investors, investors in high yield, investors in cuspy, triple B, downgrade fallen angels, they all benefit immediately while the Fed is setting up these facilities in the background. Yep. Because this, this involves a lot of red tape, but they're immediate beneficiaries. The reason I bring this up is because the people who are not immediate beneficiaries, even though the announcement has been made, are small and medium enterprises in this country. And that is, it's a huge chunk of the economy and it is what can go wrong because of the massive delay and lag we've seen in the rollout, including the Fed's Main Street program. But again, risky asset investors, hedge funds, mutual funds, they're all benefiting immediately upon any Fed announcement. So how does that conversation go? I've never uh, worked at the Federal Reserve. I, I certainly won't be at the top of, uh, of the list in terms of who they'd like to, to, to interview, and I, <laughs> I wouldn't anyway. Uh, but if, like, how does that conversation go? I mean, um, asset manager A calls asset manager B, and we have a conference call, and then we try to think about how we could reorder the deck chairs because currently we have a lot of asset management products that are, uh, God forbid, susceptible to economic gravity that are going straight down, so we need to fix that. And then I'm going to get on TV and tell you, hey, don't fight the Fed. Uh, and isn't that a nice 
nice cycle. Doesn't that just give you the warm and fuzzies? I mean, every single bubble vision interview I listen to, they say you can't fight the Fed. You got to follow the Fed. You absolutely have to be where the Fed is. They have a point, but at the same time, they're talking their book. And at the same time, the Fed's letting them. They're the ultimate enabler. And that gets us back to the original discussion of when history looks back at this. And I think history will look back at this in the court system because the Fed's never, the Fed couldn't find an exit sign if the theater was on fire. They just, they, they can't. Fed does not know exit. So when the dust settles and the courts look back on this at credit allocation, which is an express violation of the Federal Reserve Act, and look and, and see who the victims were and who the victors were, and the Fed once again trying to pump up that top 1%, I just, the, the optics are going to be awful if there is a protracted economic downturn, which by the way, all the hedge fund guys will tell you there won't be. Mm -hmm. If you ask any of them, this is going to be V-shaped because the Fed is going to make it V-shaped. I just don't see it. Well, I had, I've had uh, many interesting conversations in my, uh, in my grand honk days here at Hedge. I just walk up and down, you know, in the office by myself talking to clients. And um, I was accused <laughs> last week, and I wanted to make sure that you knew this uh, firsthand because I, I didn't uh, send you a note on it, that you and I have been accused of being part of the chorus. Okay, so you know, I, I was told again. It was from a hedge fund uh, person in particular, saying, "Yeah, you're part of the chorus with Danielle, and you're, you don't you don't get it. You don't get that this is going to happen and that's going to happen, and this is how we get paid." And it really is. It kind of like I wanted to have a shower after that discussion. Um, yeah. It, it, it's who the hell gets to have these conversations and get ahead of the game because these are massive trades. Like you said, it doesn't matter whether or not the Fed bought. Uh, those fixed income ETFs or not, it's the expectation that they're going to. And if you've got positioned ahead of it, it's like, ha ha, Keith, you and Danielle are part of a chorus. Like, are you kidding me? Yeah, part of the chorus. Okay, so there's like, there's been a run on sanitizer. So I don't know how we get this off the skin. But l let me put it this way. I received an email from an individual at one of these great big firms the day before the Fed announced that it was going to be buying fallen angels, asking if the Fed was going to be grandfathering in fallen angels downgraded after March 23rd. The word was on the street before it happened. And I would remind you that in 1987, in the aftermath of the stock market crash, that the granddaddy of all puts, Alan Greenspan, sanctioned the New York Fed's market desk, leaking information ahead of Fed moves to inject liquidity into the markets, such that they could front run the Fed. As best I can tell, because at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard, the next morning, right there with that bloody jobless claims report, the Fed came out announcing that it was going to be buying fallen angels. As best I can tell, word had already leaked out onto the street beforehand. Mm -hmm. And you saw movement in HYG the day before. Yeah, well, you saw it many days before that. I mean, there, there have been plenty of leaks. Uh, I just want people, and this is why I built Hedge, at least partly, I wanted to give people transparency into how it actually works. People trade on inside information. There's a huge payday associated with that because not everybody gets caught. Okay, so um, this is really like, when we start talking about the uh, you know, court proceedings and, and things of that nature, like that, that's not going to happen in time. There's still going to be all these moments you know, these ha-ha moments where I'm, I, I wrote about this the other day, which is it's about who you're connected to, not about getting the fundamentals right. Like, what do you think about that? Well, look, I don't want to be accused of being a conspiracy theorist, but this is all pretty much to the naked eye. This is prima facie evidence. You don't have to be brilliant to figure out what's happening. You just have to listen to how condescending, patronizing, uh, a lot of the investment community is right now because look, look at you. The firms are even insolvent and the Fed is rescuing them. See, I told you so. Yeah. There is something that is so reprehensible, so <laughs> disgusting about this. It's gross. And, and, and the thing is, you know, look, um, this, this is something that came out of uh, Josh Brown's group a few days ago. One in six U.S. companies today does not have the cash flow to survive, to, to, to cover one month of lost earnings before interest and in taxes. So the sheer population of zombies tells you 
that the Treasury might have to come in and recapitalize these special purpose vehicles that are going to withstand losses. Because it, if, if a firm is insolvent and has inadequate cash flows and goes out of business, it doesn't matter if Jay Powell bought it or not. It's still insolvent and gone. Right. I mean, well, there's a big difference between, and, and this is really, uh, it's even the first cartoon guys on our, in our slide deck, uh, which is, there's a big difference between liquidity and solvency. Okay. So, yeah. um, now, and, and I really, and this is the last one on this topic, and then I want to go to a different one. Um, what, what, what is it about Wall Street's arrogance at this point where you can parade yourself around as one of the richest people that you've ever fathomed to be, and you're so good. You're so good at investing. You understand the cycle so beautifully and perfectly that it's different this time. You can lever anything up as far as the eye can see, buy back as much stock as you want. You get the executive paid on earnings per share and a lower share count. Ha ha. You know, but you just can't quite get it at the cycle turns. So every time the cycle turns, we have to reorder the deck chairs and turn around and say, those people that call the cycle, you guys are part of that chorus, aren't you? Yeah, well, that's the bitch of it, Keith. Did I just say that? Um, <laughs> And, and that is why what the Fed is doing right now gives a whole new meaning to, to conflict of interest. Um, this is, pe people are always, you know, they're constantly on my Twitter feed, but the Fed's a private, it's owned by the banks, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, it is not. It is a full federal agency, the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. Their email addresses end in .gov. And they are duty bound to the people of the country, not a small coterie of Wall Street hedge fund private equity guys who have the gall to lobby Congress, which uh, Apollo and others did. But the gall to lobby Congress and say our companies inside of our portfolios have fewer than 500 employees, by the way, Look the other way. We've loaded them up with debt to their eyeballs. That's what we do. We're leveraged buyout kings. But we think that they should be eligible for the PPP program. I mean, again, th th you simply don't have enough. You, you can't take a long enough shower to get that off of you. And, and this is a full federal agency. And that's why I think that this will eventually come up in the aftermath, because hopefully some leader Maybe not from the left, maybe not from the right, maybe from in between where it doesn't exist. Maybe somebody's finally going to stand up for Americans because it's about time. Well, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, these are all great leaders. I've heard of uh, fantastic leadership uh, that even Trump couldn't describe with better adjectives. Uh, but Jamie Dimon, who's one of the world's greatest, people call him by his first name. They've never, never even met the man. Um, but, uh, but here he is in all of his glory uh, yesterday taking wicked low loan loss provisions relative to the economic reality we have. Uh, talking up how good the quarter was, da 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 da. Uh, but at the same time, you know, J.P. Morgan was giving again SBA loans to Potbelly Corp. You know, great name for this, by the way. Uh, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. These are public. It's not small company loans. It's small cap stocks that are clients of J.P. Morgan. So yeah. you know, that's. Meanwhile, I got people in my town and in your town and every other town, you know, who actually, you know, that, that who that was for, uh, who are getting at jack shit. So I mean, it isn't. I mean, I guess the awareness starts with the leadership. He, he didn't quite explain the quarter that way. You know, by the way, some of these massive companies that are getting these loans are, are pissing through their cash at just, I mean, this is, this is throwing, this is worse than throwing bad money, good money after bad. This is, it's just, it's, I don't know. It, it, it makes your skin crawl. And, and when you see that the, the, the vast majority of the initial recipients of these small business loans are contractors, I mean, you're talking about companies that need to come, that need bridge financing effectively, yep. that come out of this just fine. Sorry, but housing's going to be in the, in the pisser for a very long time. We saw just today that the National Association of Home Builders fell by 42 points to 30. I mean, from 72 to 30. Anybody who thinks that, that, that a contractor should be the one who gets the money right away, is it just none of this makes sense, Keith. None of it makes sense. Clearly, we're both angry about it. But to your initial point, we're not bitter about it because we were wrong. We're angry about it because what's happening is wrong. Right. 
No, in principle, it's absolutely wrong, and I think that that's why you picked up on it right away right as well. I don't know the man. Incidentally, he's Canadian. Maybe you do need a couple Canadians and a, and a great gal from Texas to point out the American free market capitalism of it all. Um, but that, that moment that Chamath, I think his, his first name is, I, apologies if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. If I am, then great. Uh, you know, again, that is what a free market capitalist sounds like. But, uh, you know, fo- like hero or foe. I mean, it was the, the, the scowl. On, on the judge or whatever the hell's Wapner's uh, face when he was actually talking about somebody going through a, a, a fully loaded American bankruptcy cycle was disgusting. And people went nuts about it. I, I tweeted it out myself. I, 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 I actually said, you are my hero on Twitter. Just because- Who, Chamath? Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just because he pointed out the fact that the employees are are not the victims in a restructuring bankruptcy program. It's the shareholders. It's the people who own subordinated. It's the people who are supposed to lose, not the people who are made to win by Fed actions. And that's the point of bastardizing the entire U.S. judicial system and the bankruptcy code that exists for a reason. (laughs) It's crazy. I mean, it is batshit crazy that that's the line that he takes. I mean, Scott Wapner sits there and he kisses the ass of Cooperman and Ackman. Uh, Ackman, who's trying to manipulate his hedge, or at least, you know, that could be read that way, Bill. I'm not quite sure if you did it that way. But again, people using the platform to push their own book and somebody actually says something that is about red, white, and blue as you can get, and it is scowled upon. Oh, was that a moment? That was a, there are moments, you know, Fonzie jumping the shark, that was one. Thank you for that levity. I think we needed it, Keith. Yeah, I mean, it's just, um, it, it, it is, the whole thing is, is, is disgusting. Because again, I want to be told in meetings, and, and you do too, I mean, you run a great independent research business. Neither of us have these conflicts of interest uh, where we're either trying to generate an asset management fee or an advertising dollar. Um, again, where we're trying to have discussions about the cycle. The cycle cycles. There's a bankruptcy cycle. It's a very healthy part of the American system where new leaders can rise up and leadership, you know, also on the balance sheet. Don't forget that new cash comes in, new life, new leadership, and takes yep. it to a better place. And that is exactly what free market capitalism should all be about. And for, for, the, for the life of me, other than you and that guy who I didn't know before uh, seeing a clip of him, I don't see a lot of that on TV anywhere. You know, there's not. And you're always being shown the markets through the prism of the speculators and the investors. And you're, you're, they're giving precious little airtime to, thank you, 44% of US GDP, 47% of US employment. This is small business in America. Maybe it used to have a bigger footprint, but maybe we, this, this is pre-fight the Fed days when the Fed sanctions the, the monopolization of of, of the economy such that any innovate any innovator is sucked up by a fan company immediately they're like oh look they're, they're doing something right we'll acquire them and that's kind of why small businesses footprint has shrunk a little bit in recent years but it's still huge and it needs to be looked at in in, in the same way that a lot of that, that the public markets look at any given company whether or not it's a liquidity or a solvency issue but right now the public markets are being treated as if Insolvency is simply illiquidity, and small business is being left behind even though they're solvent and just illiquid. Yeah, on, uh, guys, on slide 79 in the current macro deck, just so that people have the data associated with what, uh, with, with what Danielle's talking about, how long can a small business survive a shutdown? Uh, one to three months, that's 50, uh, 34%. And then on the right side of this chart, Danielle, if you can see it or not, is the percentage of households with no emergency savings by age, which is a really p- a pathetic thing and a sad thing. Um, but again, like I'm no socialist, but I have no problem with people um, that can't f- feed their kids or, or, or pay their rent get s- some ki- something. You know, again, I'm not trying to be like out there on the political spectrum with this. These are the numbers, and we're not certainly uh, aff- affecting um, that problem uh, explicitly like we could. And I think that is a leadership problem. Um, so I, I, I think we, we, we agree uh, on that. On the cycle itself, um, okay, 
Uh, we have, you know, generally a cycle, a workout period in a bankruptcy cycle, a full-blown credit cycle, an employment cycle. You know, can take uh, anywhere between nine, fourteen. In the case of the, the Great Depression, guys on slide um, uh, on slide forty-nine, you can see all the drawdowns and the lengths of periods of depressions, recessions, etc. You know, but this one's going to end in two months. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that, Danielle, because unfortunately, from the all-time stock market bubble high, uh, we need to end it there, or people are going to actually the real job losses are going to be on Wall Street. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? And it's so, you know, I was actually, I was listening to Bloomberg TV this morning, Mark Kiesel, who's actually a friend of mine over at PIMCO, he's, uh, he, he was saying something that was, he was getting a, a little bit of pushback because he was saying that this downturn is going to be so protracted that the U.S. consumer is going to change the way they perceive money itself. The, the slide you put up a few minutes ago about having no cushion, I don't think we're going back there anytime soon. And the implications, the implications for a consumption-driven economy are simply unappreciated because they're, they're a complete unknown. We're not, we're not used to Americans being frugal. We're not used to having substantial cushions in savings. It's, it's just, it's foreign to our culture. But I think that Mark, and this is something I've been writing about and, and saying, this is going to have a profound effect on the trajectory and the duration of the current downturn that is simply not appreciated on Wall Street or in Washington DC. Do you do you th I mean do you have um do you have a timeline that you're thinking in terms of, you know, covid to the to the quote unquote uh, opening of the economy uh, to the next part and then part after that. Do you have a duration that you have in mind? The only thing that I'm studying is 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 Indonesia. I'm studying Singapore. I'm studying uh, other com countries that actually were very much more forceful uh, and, and aggressive in in staunching COVID-19 in their countries. I'm seeing them slowly try to open up, and a second wave already coming in of uh, of of the virus. And I would add to that the fact that uh, I follow very closely a map of the United States that shows mobility and how much less or more mobile we are compared to before the virus. And most of the country is moving around. Mm -hmm. So I think trying to suggest when anybody knows when this is gonna end is crazy because we have not, you know, the president talks nonstop about opening the country back up. P.S. the country's not closed in large parts. I mean, up, up in the Northeastern corridor, Certainly that is the case. But if you look at much of the rest of the country, it is open and people are mobile, which means that this virus that is five whole months old, because they, they knew about it in mid-November uh, in, in Wuhan, and that's, that, that's actually documented data, and, and our intelligence community do, knew about it in mid-November. But take that and then and, and say you've got five whole months of data about one of the most one of the most contagious viruses ever to, to hit the planet. There's no way of knowing with any certainty when this is going to end, but we do know that second waves will occur. And that's in countries that totally shut down, not in countries that stayed half open like the United States is. Mm -hmm. Now that, I mean, you're in, in Texas, I mean, right before we, we went live, you were explaining, you know, life in Texas, at least where you're at, is a hell of a lot different than where I'm at. There is zero traffic on the way from Westport, Connecticut to Stanford. Usually takes me 45 minutes. Now it takes me 13 minutes. And the only cars on the road aren't cars. They're construction guys with trucks. Yes, it's, it's being taken a lot less seriously in many areas of the country. Uh, liberty is seen as, you know, it's right up there with being able to have a gun. And, mm -hmm. you know, there were, there were Easter church service, services in Mississippi, for example, uh, on, on Easter Sunday. So take with a grain of salt the idea of the whole of the United States being in lockdown because it's just not the case. That's not to be, that's not, I'll, I'll distinguish because Dallas, for example, is, is, is all non-essential companies are closed through May the 20th. That's not to say that there's not economic damage occurring throughout the country at, at, you know, at, at different levels, but there's still mobility. Mm -hmm. So you've got business shut down and the virus moving around. Mm -hmm.
Uh, um, before we get to your questions, by the way, if you have questions, pop them in the queue. Uh, they'll be voted on, and I'll ask Danielle. We're gonna, I'll, I'll go with you for another five minutes here, Danielle, and then I'll go to the questions. But you mentioned housing, and, and you've tweeted most recently about the elderly. You got you know, the boomer generation, their assets. You got the stock market as a deflating asset. You know, what do you think all that together? So, uh, you know, the silver tsunami, as they call it, was supposed to be 30 million some odd homes coming out onto the market in a very orderly fashion over the next few years. I, I propose that the baby boomers who, who've seen their 401ks burn not once but twice, now, now is a third time. Despite the rebound in the stock market, I think that you're going to have, once the housing market opens up, once you can have open houses again, I think the baby boomers are gonna try and be, try and get, gain that first mover advantage and get their home listed on the market as soon as possible. Yeah. And I think that that's why we're, we're, we're going to see a vacuum, a pocket down in home prices. AEI, actually, right now, they're doing some great weekly data on home price movement, and it is happening really, really fast. So I think once you get that first set of comparables out there, that there is going to be a shock wave that, that goes through the housing market as baby boomers look to liquidate the equity that they've built up in their homes and decrease what their fixed income cash flow needs are on a monthly basis saying, I'm out, I, I can't work for another 10 years. So you're going to see an expediting of a cycle that has massive economic ramifications for how long this can spread the cycle out. Well, and the other side, the other side of that, you know, because you're talking about the supply side, is is the demand piece. So again, as everybody knows, who loses their job, you can't apply for a frickin' mortgage, right? So we're seeing mortgage purchase applications on a weekly basis, you know, hit levels that we haven't seen since 08 in rate of change terms. Actually, you know, even pre a lot of these March numbers, as you know, Danielle, because you're a, a bean counter like I am. I mean, you know, we're seeing March numbers, which are the worst rate of change slowdowns ever. You know, I was saying that this morning. Ever's a fucking long time, okay? So Ever. nobody doesn't really know what that means, obviously. Uh, what they hope is that it's a V bottom and they can go back to making money long all the pro assets, you know, pro cyclical assets that they bought wrongly at the top. Um, but again, this is, this is where you're at. You mean millennials as a generation is being fired for the first time in their life. They are, and they've been living really close to the edge with their experiential lifestyle and they don't want boomers homes either. Yep. They want to stay in urban centers. I mean, I know that there's going to be a shift in the way we perceive urban centers because of density and the risks that go, you know, on a health level there. But they sure as hell don't want some McMansion in the suburbs <laughs> and they can't afford it either. And they certainly could never afford the property taxes that are going to be rising in coming years. So the, the, the supply demand mismatch that would be typical in a recession is going to be even more stretched. The, the, the divide between the two um, generational cohorts is going to be vast. And the only thing that's going to resolve the disconnect, the divide, is for prices to come down more than people are anticipating. Well, that's, I mean, and it, I also get this feedback, I'm sure you do too, on, on Twitter. There's an enti that entire generation is new to watching a stock market crash. I mean, this is the biggest stock market crash point to point over a certain period of time since 1987. People are like, wow, that's that's crazy. Maybe I should follow some people that were actually in front of it. Uh, so you see a lot of millennials, the feedback is this, Danielle, which is, hey, have the rules changed? Like, should I have been as levered up as some of my dysfunctional <laughs> friends? Should I really not had two or three jobs? You know, should I really have savings at all? Like, what am I being told here? And I get I get that a lot. A lot of really thoughtful millennial comments on that, on that thread, which eventually get to the place which, hey, why don't they let it fail so that I can finally buy some of the things that my parents did? And, and there's a lot of that. And, you know, to, to have a generation that is fairly entitled get slapped in the face is, again, the, the effects are going to be profound. And uh, look, I, I think one of the best solutions you could possibly come up with in the coming years is parents saying, you know what, there's plenty of room here. Why don't you move on home? And nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to think about it. Certainly home builders don't. Uh, and you saw, like, like I said, you saw the home building index crash this morning, nothing like we've ever seen. Um, but, but there's going to be a rethink. There's going to be a reset 
there's going to be a revisiting of frugality that we've not seen since the generation that lived through the Great Depression. And you don't get that by listening to Bubble Vision because of the people who have benefited from it. But the other 99% of the population is going to be giving a big rethink to how they perceive money. Yeah, of and, course. I mean, and, the, and that, that's a game changer. It's, it's something that changes the way we think about cycles. The worst declines ever, ever is your new four letter word, all right? So that's, that's a really bad word, and people are going to start to understand the ramifications of that, but it's going to take some time. Bubble vision is not going to be your answer. I think everybody knows that. Let's go to the wood and take um, some questions. First question, not a huge conceptual surprise here, Danielle, has to do with uh, the dollar. Uh, currently, the dollar is very strong against the rest of the world's currencies. Do you see that changing anytime soon? I, I think in the interim, because it is such a shit show in most of the rest of the world that we're still the most attractive horse in the glue factory. You have to keep in mind that that frontier market, emerging markets, Asia, Europe, the debt buildup in the rest of the world is so enormous that while this is what most on Wall Street prefer to say, this is, this is not a regular recession, this, this is a virus recession. You have to look at it that way. But the debt buildup in the rest of the world is so immense that it is taking down economies that haven't been taken down in decades. India looks like it's going to hit its first recession in 40 years in the emerging markets complex. Australia, developed market, first uh, recession in 30 years. And the debt buildup is so big in Canada and in uh, Australia that it's going to feel like a balance sheet recession, which is what we suffered in 08, 09, on top of a global slow down the likes of which we've never seen. So as long as there's positivity in treasury yields, the U.S. dollar is still going to be perceived as a safe haven. Yeah, well, I, you know, the world is, a lot of the leverage is denominated in dollars, and that's another thing. When people are running out yeah. of dollars, those dollars in high demand. Um, that yes. point that you made on global fragility, uh, guys, slide 66 in the current macro deck, which is, again, it, when somebody tells me nobody could have seen this coming, clearly they don't do macro in rate of change terms. So, again, this is global trade volume on a year-over-year -year basis, the worst it had been in a decade pre-virus, okay, pre-virus. So if, right. that, if that's your condition pre-virus, and this is something you said to me before we, we went live on the switch here, Danielle, you said, hey, you know, it didn't have to be the virus. The preconditions were there uh, from a global perspective. Obviously, everyone can see that, uh, unless, again, you didn't know that China started slowing in 2018 and Europe went into, parts of Europe went into a recession. Now they're back in a recession again. EM started to collapse. It all, it was happening, okay? Um, so how much of that do you have to fend off? Like when you actually, you know, you, you, you're, you're in a lot of media these days. Like, do you, do you have to actually just regurgitate what I just said as a given, given the level of macro and awareness associated with that? Yes, you actually have to go back and say in 2001, we had a shallow risk. We had a shallow recession because global trade was positive. You have to go back and remind them of these things that it wasn't, you know, it, you have to go back to the 1980s, the really ugly recession, the global financial crisis, the really ugly recession and say, what was the common denominator? And that was contracting world trade, which was already in existence full year 2019 prior to any virus hitting the news wires. Mm -hmm. And that you have to distinguish. We were already headed towards an ugly global slowdown by looking through that singular prism of world trade, which we've skirted recession before, as long as world trade was positive, it was not. Yep, that is uh, dead on accurate, and it's good to, good to hear. Um, all right, second question, uh, and this is uh, aligned with, we, we do have some, uh, our audiences uh, like, I think they like the different forms of, uh, in, in terms of where we're sp speaking. So this has to do with something that Raul Paul said at, at, at Real Vision, um, saying that if CPI goes negative and the Fed is above the zero bound, real rates go positive because real rates equal the benchmark minus CPI. Can that actually happen? I don't know if you followed everything that I just said in the question. But. Yes. Yes, it actually can mathematically happen. It's perfectly yep. conceivable. And when you see negative 8.7 on retail sales, when you see that clothing sales have fallen by 50%, when you see port traffic collapsing, when you know that this is a global phenomenon, when you know that 
that 40% of consumption in the United States is uh, is taken care of by the top 20% of earners. You can just kiss the entire luxury sector goodbye when you know that one out of every 10 jobs created in the past decade was in travel and tourism. Yep. There are simply going to be too many different distinct gravitational pulls on prices initially outside of that gallon of milk we go through one a day in my house there are going to be too many different distinct housing is the largest one it's the largest input into the cpi there are too many things that are going to be dragging on inflation to not see that potentially go negative yeah and, and the bond, the bond market by the way for those of you that aren't up first of all your net wealth should be up year to date because your top three holdings should be u.s dollars u.s treasuries again betting on treasuries is betting on deflation which is what Danielle just, just addressed. So again, if you're betting on slower growth, again, you're not fighting the Fed, you're actually betting on economic gravity. So let's just get that clear uh, before some other knucklehead like Wapner confuses you. Uh, and then gold, gold trades with real interest rates. So as long as interest, uh, inflation expectations continue to fall, real yields fall, and gold's number one uh, inverse correlation is to that. Um, on, 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 just, just before you ask me the next question, really quickly, we could print our way into higher interest rates. Yeah. That's a whole separate discussion. Yeah. We could we, we could blow our deficits out so much. We could we could spend so much. I mean, we are a socialist nation right now. There is no other nation on planet Earth right now that is throwing as much stimulus as a percentage of GDP at its economy as the United States. You could have a situation where 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 un unemployment is 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 still falling or low. Uh, excuse me. Uh, unemployment is still rising and high. And you could have a situation where prices are declining and yet there is some kind of mutiny at a treasury auction. You just don't, don't, don't say it's impossible. Yeah, no, no, definitely not impossible. In fact, we saw the, before the Fed came in with 75 billion a day, a day. Um, you know, we were seeing actually, the leading indicator for that is the, 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 the move index or the treasury bond vol index. Yep. And that started to move. And then that's when the Fed jumped in. Because if you can't control the volatility of interest rates, you've lost the whole thing completely. Uh, which, by the way, happened in 2008. Uh, interest rates stopped going down in March and then only went up until October and then they went straight down again. But again, that's that's the history. I mean, there's certainly, a, I would never say it's impossible. So I use, you know, real-time market signals to make sure I'm not on the wrong side of that. Uh, slide 90, though, on what you addressed, uh, guys, the uh, what we call the, you affectionately call the, the, the government's anti-economic gravity machine. Um, you had a good run, Danielle. You got you to gotta, you gotta give it that. Um, but again, uh, eventually these two bedfellows meet in, in bed. Uh, so the unemployment rate hooks up alongside the deficit as a percentage of GDP. So that's that's where we're going. Um, that's, that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, for a while, people, uh, you know, the whole, ha ha, investor, like I can buy anything with leverage and I'm going to get paid because the cycle's never going to go that way. Well, now it is going that way. So we're going to have uh, the next edition of that. Um, this question has to do with that, actually, from Joe. Um, what, what represents, and I know you have some, some, um, some, some thoughts on this, what represents a greater threat to capitalism, Danielle? Negative interest rates or unrestrained MMT? What is more likely or imminent, and are they both threats? I think it's really hard to disentangle the two. Right. Um, because they, they kind of, they walk hand in hand with one another. And if you take modern monetary theory out to the extreme on, you know, philosophically speaking, negative interest rates can be imposed and you can continue to, to, to borrow as much as you want. Um, I think that negative interest rates pose an existential threat to the banking system. And we have one of the last functional banking systems, truly functional banking systems uh, in the developed world. So, and you know, I have very little left to say that's positive about Jay Powell, but at least he has consistently said that he's not going there uh, because he's certainly become a massive proponent just by actions of MMT. Mm -hmm. Here's another question on that um, on, for Powell. And this is where, again, I, if you're bearish on some of my positions, i.e. the dollar or treasuries, you are looking for some kind of Italian uh, systemic risk. Don't forget that Italian bond yields are going up now. The euro is going down now. Um, and as Danielle pointed out, we're not alone in the currency war, uh, or certainly in terms of having deficit spending or socialist countries in the case of Italy. Um, but <laughs> this is a good question from Michael, uh, as you eloquently define, like you could, you could explain what happened in, in 00 and 07 if you walked into a bar. Uh, but now, you know, how's Powell gonna explain that? 
It's, you know, I, I don't want to be him. I don't want to be the private equity guy who's bailing out private equity. And for him to come in and be able to explain what's happening. And, and they, he is, frighteningly enough, he has the same line that Wall Street has. And that is that this virus was no fault of insolvent, overly indebted. Wait, he doesn't use those words. But this, this crisis was not the fault of these companies, and therefore they should be made whole. Why is my question to him? And that is a question that he would never be able to answer. Well, they wouldn't ask it. I mean, did you see the Brookings Institute? You talk about bubble vision. I mean, that was a oh, joke. God. Just fawning, faint, uh, just, oh, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. But eventually, I mean, and this is, and, and I hope this is the country I came to as a, a Canadian who didn't want to be part of, at the time, uh, the socialist government in Canada. I was like, I want to, I like this red, white, and blue free market capitalism thing. I could play hockey with these Americans too. This would be great. You know, I'm going to come yeah. here and I'm going to like, like this. And I did. Um, and I did and I did and I did and I still do. And, but I do believe that, that when the rubber meets the road, Americans aren't going to roll over. And maybe this channel, you know, this communication channel that we have, this conversation right now, is a big part of it. You know, you and I have a lot of followers. You can't just ignore us anymore. Uh, can Jay Powell, can the Federal Reserve, can the entire edifice of old wall, bubble vision, and I mentioned a couple big names out there, can they ignore us forever? I, I don't think that they can because this is not, this is not 07, this is not 00. The communication happens so rapidly, yeah. the word spreads so quickly, and you're not talking about you know conspiracy theorists up in the middle of the night. You're talking about rational, middle class, well educated investors who are trying to go about it by the book and understand that they're being screwed to the wall. Again, this is this is not some redneck theory, and. <laughs> It's just not. It's, it's not. not. This is not a redneck phenomenon. This is this is this is happening to real people who have real edge. I mean, the question I get asked the most on my Twitter feed is should I burn my MBA? Yep. Because my education's not worth anything if this is how perverted capitalism has become. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I would just call Powell uh, a liar. I mean, slide 71, guys. I mean, this is where corporate debt was as a percentage of GDP. And by the way, this is, you know, if I were to, to show this nominally as, a per, as opposed to a per, per percent of GDP, i.e. the amount of, of nominal debt, I mean, it's, it's, it, blo it would blow your mind. It would look like I'm, I'm trying to make it make the chart look worse. But 100% of the time, this is what happens at the end of an economic cycle when Wall Street gets piggy and levered long investors get way too long in the twos. Everybody's getting paid way too much and the complacency peaks in kind. Uh, the second thing to show is slide 72, which is triple B's percentage of the market. And then, uh, you know, uh, debt to EBITDA, like look at, looking at IG in particular. So he knows damn well what it is. That's why I nicknamed him P.E. Pal, private equity pal. And I know over the, over the years, you and I have gone back and forth on this guy, but that yeah. guy, I think that guy is exactly who I thought he was. I, I, I was the great defender of Jay Powell, but you cannot tell me that, that this is purely a virus when the kindling had already been set. I mean, this was, this was setting up kindling in the middle of a drought in the middle of the summer, and, and, and you just needed a spark. That's what the backdrop of over indebtedness was. It was an accident waiting to happen. And it happened. And we saw it begin to unravel. And that's why people forget that they're like, oh, the Fed has come riding to the rescue. I'm like, yeah, in January 2019, this mm -hmm. is simply a continuation. This is this is not anything new. He he started riding to the rescue of, of triple B credit on January the 6th, 2019. He's just kept up ratcheting up his game. That's it. Mm -hmm. Well, this is my last question on that, and this is kind of brings me full circle. It, if he doesn't have to answer to that, he doesn't have to answer to me, doesn't have to answer to you, only has to answer to his core constituency, which we know damn well right now who that is. And if all of you are listening and it pisses you off, I don't care. You know, how does that end? How does it end and how does, does the head of the Federal Reserve eventually have to answer to the people of the United States of America? I think that that is going to be the case. I, I think, and, and this is not going to be some 
Well, and maybe I'm just speaking out of hope because I can't lose hope in the Stars and Stripes, but this is not going to be a congressional hearing where you get your wrist slapped and then you get to go back to your country club life. I think that this is something that needs to go to the Supreme Court. Checks and balances has been destroyed under the auspices of there being the need for emergency funding. You don't nationalize the financial markets quietly. And it's certainly not a, a situation that should be able to be sustained. And I do think that when checks and balances is, is called into question, that that is something that one of the two branches, because Congress is sitting by watching this happening, the administration is sitting by watching, well, they're happily sitting by watching this happen with Mnuchin at, at the drivers at, at the wheel. There is a third branch. And the third branch is the Supreme Court of the United States, and I think it will be their duty to call this into question in future generations. I'm, I'm told all the time, but it's a, it's a Republican court. No, I, I, I push back on that because you have to look at them as being a separate individual check and balance on power gone wild. Yeah. Or power gone wild, however you want to put it. That, that last I checked, that is America. So I'm not, I'm not giving up on it. I, I uh, sometimes in the morning, it's, it's easy in this, in this environment to have, you know, feelings. I try to not feel things when I trade markets, but I certainly feel things, and you do too, uh, when it comes to what is America, what is free market, uh, free market capitalism. And um, I just want to say thank you for that because I think a lot of people are probably sitting there thanking you too. You've got a tremendous amount of courage. You know, you're, you are, you know, a, pa a patriot, like how I would have defined it, even as a Canadian who didn't really know what that is. I think, <laughs> I, 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 th I think I'm looking at one right now. So, so thanks, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Good I, luck, everybody. Be safe. Yeah, we will be. Uh, we will be here in Connecticut, and I know Danielle will be in Texas too. Again, uh, keep up with what she has to say. Keep up with what everyone has to say. Again, you don't want to be part of a vacuum. Again, vacuums aren't good. And again, I would encourage you to listen to the other sides of everything that we're saying as well and come to your own decisions. Still today, this is the United States of America, and I think you should be proud about that. All right, thanks. We'll be back in 15 minutes, and uh, we'll fire this thing. We'll fire this thing right up again.